The nurses were great nurses. Judy Jezulewski, um, she ran the renal unit because we had a lot of renal shutdown, a lot of kidney shutdown because of the blood, the amount of blood we had to give these guys. And we didn't have time to type and cross match. So we weren't always giving an A positive patient A positive blood. We were giving them all O positive blood because that was the universal donor. And we didn't have time to type and cross match. So because of that, we had some renal issues. And we also had, um, there was also some copper sulfite issues in some of the um, treatments we were using, like for phosphorus burns. We used copper sulfite on the phosphorus. You know, the phosphorus grenades, when they went off, could burn right through you. Burn right through you. And the, the counteractant to that was copper sulfate. Well, then we found out it caused renal failure. But anyways, Judy Desilewski, who I said is in St. Louis, she was a remarkable renal nurse. I mean, just remarkable. And when I had to play supervisor, that's how I learned all their talents. And, and they were strong women. But they were all well trained, every single one, well trained. We had very few, you know, go spacey. I only remember one that just flipped out completely. And uh, she was new to country. She really hadn't been in a strong nursing program back home. Of course, I was trained in Massachusetts. I mean, you, you trained where I was trained. I mean, you know, when you're trained by the Sisters of Mercy, they have no mercy. They have none. You know, so, <laughs> you know, you, you didn't have time to break down when you were trained by them. But I only remember one, one nurse who was very young, and uh, they had assigned her down to me, and I had to, I had to tell the chief nurse she had to go someplace uh, that was not quite as... Someplace to season her. Mm-hmm. Because it just, uh, she, wasn't ready for, she wasn't ready to see some of the things that we saw. Uh, Henri ran over to a helicopter and talked to this guy and then he waved at me and I went over and got on this helicopter with him. And w here we are, I don't know where we are, we're leaving for I don't know where to. And we flew out of there about 10 minutes on this Marine CH-34 helicopter which is Korean War vintage, uh, shaking, I mean, give you a real massage. Uh, and we flew out of there about 10 minutes and we circled and I'm looking out the open door and there's a, a hill, not very high hill, in the middle of a, a rice paddy, a big rice paddy, like so. And uh, we landed on top of that hill and the guy shut the chopper off and, and there was dead silence. And we got out and I looked around and there were probably 200 little, they weren't foxholes, they didn't have time, they were just little indentations and there was a man lying in each one like he was holding a rifle except there was no rifle and that man was dead, and they were all dead. They had been overrun, and all of them were killed by the Viet Cong. And what we were doing there was the crew chief of that helicopter needed help. We had to go man to man until we found the two American advisors and recovered their bodies and brought them back to the helicopter and brought them home. And that was our, our, that's the only reason that guy led us on that helicopter was he needed help carrying the bodies. And, and I, I, it was a shock. It was a total shock. And I, you know, until that moment, my knowledge of war was limited to John Wayne movies, for God's sakes. Uh, but now I saw the reality of it. I saw 200 dead Vietnamese, uh, and I saw two dead Americans, and I looked at their faces, and I carried their bodies. And I looked at them all the way back to that base on that helicopter, and. Uh, they didn't look like John Wayne to me.